everybody, how you doing? Brian Polito, and this is welcome to my show called Beer with Brian. This is the easiest show to do. <laughs> I'm very lucky that I have Julian the Hooligan Hi. as my cameraman for today, and it's Friday, so around four o'clock here at HQ. It's the last hour, and you know it's okay. I'm the boss. Julian's my boy. If I have a little something. Something, it's all right. I think I have in the background, we have uh, Brandy Sparkles just checking things out. Hi, Brandy. I'm sure we're all Hi, kind people. of in line. And look, the premise of Beer with Brian is really simple, actually. It's, uh, it's a more informal, less high amplitude Polito and a chance to kind of talk. So if you have anything you want to discuss, uh, please please make mention in the comments. Hooligan will... Uh, yell it out, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of pontificate on what the heck is going on. So, Scott says hello. Scott, Scott, Scott no. Scott. Scott. So Scott, no. As you know, we've been trading uh, what's playing on the turntable. I'm going to tell you a fun story, but before I do, may I please <laughs> offer some apple shine, Ooh. courtesy of the fiend inebriator. To the one and only hooligan. Oh, and hang thank on, you, my man. Mm. I'm, I'm going to do the same. <laughs> clink, clink, and let's kind of start the weekend off. Right? All right. Mm. Oh yeah. Ooh, boing. wow. Ooh. Oh, boing. Oh, boing is right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got sparkles. Is having a beer. It's kind of fun too. Uh, for fun, actually, hooligan. For those of you who don't know. Uh, our conference room actually features a coffin-shaped bar, <laughs> fully stocked bar, and right now our cool uh, on wheels coffin is sort of the bartender back there. But yeah, it's kind of cool. What a blessing, right? That we get. First of all, if we're gonna have a conference room, you gotta have a bar, just I, in I case. Know, yeah, I don't know what kind of company you work with, but that's the kind of company we work with. And then secondarily, you make sure that thing is stocked. But uh, in it. And we've really been blessed because ours is stocked not only with the finest spirits known to man, but also material made by the one and only Fiend Inebriator. Mm-hmm. That's some good moonshine. Shine, shine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess I'll talk to you guys. I felt like I've been out of touch. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit is like what the heck's been going on. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, really my day-to-day -day is really about making the comics. You know, there's a quality to each day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, from a publishing perspective, and that's really what we've been up to, you know, head down, and I'm always juggling whether it's kind of administrative stuff. I work with uh, the editorial staff, who is uh, veteran letter Marshall Dillon, who's now our managing editor, mm -hmm. uh, Nick G, who kind of floats among several departments, but is also editor. And then we work with all the, on a daily basis, all the talent. I'm always co-writing with Mike McLean, which is a joy. Mike was here yesterday and here at, excuse me, HQ, and I'm hard at work. He and I are hard at work on a brand new story for you and more to come on that. And we're, we're doing, from our perspective, we've been working together for seven years plus and like we're breaking the story down. Kind of come from this point of view that the story exists, but our consciousness hasn't honed in on it yet. We have a lot of cool goals for this next story and I apologize, I'm going to be kind of ambiguous about that, but we kind of have a lot of interesting goals. You want to present something that hasn't quite been seen before. Uh, so that's that piece. And, you know, I'll be juggling. Mike and I are writing back and forth. But I could tell you, too, you know, one thing I always like to talk about is how is our publishing schedule going? Well, you know, next uh, next couple of weeks, we uh, are offering the La Muerta Onslaught Kickstarter beginning May 12th. Uh, soft sell on that. And if you're part of our mailing list or if you backed... Uh, La Muerta previously, we actually sent a PDF preview out to you guys and gals. So, and then in the next thing that we're doing is we are, well, Mike and I are hard at work on late of chapter 15. Wait till I tell you the name of that thing in September. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to butcher it. <laughs> right up there with all these crazy sacrificial annihilation. <laughs> it's up there. Uh, but yeah, Mike and I are, we've completed, uh, we, we also break our stories down. So in a 48 page story, we have a part one that ends on page 24. Uh, just how we roll. And one of the reasons we do that is it's kind of a good discipline. It kind of works out the way he and I both see story structure, comic book story structure. 
but it also allows us when we go to the comics market to break the story into two parts and always end on a cliffhanger. Always got to end on a cliffhanger. The story never ends. But yeah, so we're done with uh, chapter 15, thus the complete script. And, and I get ahead of myself, but that's like after what happens in chapter 14. And then I got pages in from chapter 14 that just literally blew my mind. Like editorially, I typed it out to uh, Diego Bernard. I'm like, please pass my compliments to Diego Bernard. This, this double page spread has been a dream of mine since I was a kid. Here it is. Thank you so much. And then, uh, and then Diego's representative was like, yep, this is by far the best page he's done for Coffin Comics. So now I see Hooligan and Sparkles laughing. What's going on? Brandon Williams stated, I, I love watching you mess up the names of the Kickstarters. <laughs> It shows that you are human also. I am also human. <laughs> so here's this true story, I think, of the current Lady Death. Uh, and okay, also, here's like a Beer with Brian exclusive. Tell everyone you know uh, that we are going to release the digital copy of Lady Death Cataclysmic Majesty this Tuesday. I mean, Woo! Yes, yeah! Yes. Okay, here's the true story of this title. The real, 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 real title was supposed to be Catastrophic Majesty. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. So we'd actually begun, like, we dealt with the title. We were writing the covers. I do that with Nick. And what I mean writing the covers is, as you can imagine, someone has to tell a graphic designer what goes here, what goes there, what are the contents of something like that and the accuracy of it all and that's either myself or nick uh and so early it always was catastrophic but somewhere along the line <laughs> i started writing cataclysmic and then we all got confused nine ways to sunday this is true and <laughs> frequently myself and it became cataclysmic because we had the majority of the covers were written as cataclysmic that's why <laughs> okay but it really was supposed to be think about it it was supposed to be catastrophic majesty. I like that word, catastrophic, cataclysmic. See, I think catastrophic sounds more brutal. It, it has a nice, lovely, uh, sophisticated ring to the destruction. Yeah, see, cat, like cataclysmic, cataclysmic. <laughs> smoothness, and then uh, catastrophic. It's just more <laughs> angular. So anyway, but I can assure you that latest chapter 15 is a very angular title. Anyway, I digress. Does, well, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. There is a question from uh, Stevich Ones. Any idea or plan for another Lady Death movie? It's, this has been a really wild week. And, you know, behind the scenes stuff I rarely disclose, but actually had a, uh, a conversation with potential producers about such a thing. Now, true story, had a lot of conversations about that. So, um, I don't see that there's anything like um, like super hot going on in that arena, but I would imagine in our lifetimes we'll see something. You know, one of the real challenges of doing a Lady Death movie in this part is that frequently uh, the people are putting the money up want to pay you a nominal amount of money, and then you're kind of your rights are kind of surrendered, and we actually just. We can't be up for that, if only because, you know, Lady Death and the, and the universe that comes along with it is really how uh, myself, our household, and all the crew, we, that's how we make a living. So, you know, the, when we finally make that deal, it's going to have to be far more cooperative. Anyway, so that's the answer to that. One day, who knows? Next question? <laughs> there was a follow-up. I have uh, script writing. I, I have uh, worked on draft scripts and acting if you need any assistance. I thank you kindly for your offer. Uh, actually, I have a, uh, a partner in, in bringing Lady Death to Life for the screen. I defer everything to that person, and I say this completely respectfully. We are, we'll probably likely work with veterans and folks that we've had a relationship with, but I, I wish you nothing but success and good luck. Andrew Jessica, Vasquez says, BP, we need a Sun K artist celebration. Exclamation point. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm the biggest fan of Sun K. I started actually publishing her as early as literally seven years ago. But I don't know if we have enough art yet. What I am super happy to say is we just actually extended our agreement with Sun K. 
am super happy. So you'll, I guess some, some of the cool stuff you'll see coming up is uh, in July, Sun K is doing a July 4th theme cover Ooh. set. Nice. And I actually, that's all I said. You know, like with Sun <laughs> K, she's just so rad. I just let her do what she's going to do. And then usually about a week before the deadline, she sends a couple of drawings. Each one is great. I got I have to pick the one that's the coolest. And uh, all of them are cool. And then we just get stuff that blows our mind. In fact, about last week, I got in a beautiful cover of Lady Death, Lady Satanus that we're, it'll be part of the Lady Death Chapter 14 Kickstarter. So that's sacrificial annihilation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to say it correctly. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do my best. A couple of people are asking you just to give me the title name so I can butcher it several times. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jason Wyatt says, any Jason. plans for a new instant edition? Well, that's a very good question. I think you'll have to stay tuned. Uh, if you look at us historically, we have done these instant editions around conventions, whether it's the in-person events that we've had in the past where Jason, you and I met in the wonderful Baltimore Comic Con or... Uh, last year we did it in Crucial Con. So if we are to do it, stay tuned. I like Billy's question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Billy uh, Dyden. Hey, Billy. Uh, uh, how much Sandy. are you bench pressing now? Dude, I could I'm probably bench pressing like 15 pounds. <laughs> you need to beers. You got beer. There you go. There's your bench. You got your workout in. That's it. It's been a while. <laughs> Billy, Billy, Billy. Right on. Hey. Uh, Billy is a pal of ours, and he runs a YouTube channel called uh, Economics and Comics, and he is looking to blast past 10,000 subscribers. And uh, as of a couple of hours ago, he was only 144 subscribers away. So find it in your heart to go over there because you're just going to get a wealth of information. Billy reviews Diamond Previews every month, gives you the inside track on what he speculates might have some potential value. So go over to YouTube, go over to Economics and Comics, Econ for short, and subscribe. Bob Wren said, did you watch Falcon and Winter Soldier? And if so, what did you think? Could you believe? I, I feel I've already read the comic, so no, I haven't seen it yet. I, uh, I will absolutely get to it. Uh, I'm uh, not yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm always behind the times on stuff, unless it's a giant monster. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I feel as if I'm going to totally love and adore it. As you know, I'm a big Cap fan. One of the crazier things you need to know about me is... My Cap fandom is really around the comic books. Like, that's where it really lives for me. And I do feel that the motion pictures have completely fulfilled my vision of Cap, and I've loved them, and I'm sure I'm going to love Winter Soldier. Um, but I'll get around to it. The comics are always uh, where my love really resides for this stuff. Although I'm really happy, the world probably knows this, I'm happy that you know Sam Wilson is going through his arc where he gets to be Captain America. Uh, that's cool, you know. Haven't we all really? We've read it. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. a Cap fan, we've read this story. <laughs> it was a good run, too. Yeah. Let's see, uh, is there going to be a medal for the May 4th edition? Actually, there will be two medal editions, Greg. A return of uh, Naughty Lady Slave medal, and there will be a Hell Witch, um, uh, Darth Hell. Yeah, risky, metal cover, risque, risque one. Risque Darth Hell. There's a metal for that. I didn't know. Yep. Yes. Robert Bradford, have you seen Mortal Kombat yet? Robert, I haven't. <laughs> I'm like so behind on all like the mainstream stuff. Like what I've been watching are like, let's see, what have I been watching? So on the Vice Channel, they have a true crime series called The Devil You Know. It's a and good I'm series. watching the second season, and it's all around this small, strange cult. Uh, headed up by a woman named Sherry Schreiner. And there's just a large amount of murder and suicide around the strange cult. So I've been watching that. Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I like to watch stuff that just turns my brain off. And one of my favorite things to do is to be eating food and watching shows about traveling and eating food. <laughs> so I love anything Guy Fieri does on the Food Network. So I'm watching like diners, drive-ins, and dives. Or I watch man, man versus food even during lunchtime like i turn on discovery plus and i'm like they have another show called food paradise so it's just an hour of pizza all around the country Believe how do you not eat all the food i i don't know that why it doesn't connect it doesn't oh. equal eat food to me oh for, well but, you're not a girl you know what it equals to me though is like travel 
Oh, it's like right. travel to eat food. And you know, since since the advent of that kind of stuff in the last 10 years, I, I definitely take my little checklist. And sometimes Fran and I might do a weekend all around the whole idea of like, okay, let's go to this town and you know, eat at all the places that were on a show. Oh, how fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, see, Robert Fraga, uh, that poster you see in the background was custom made for HQ. There is none available What's for the Scully store. Pop? Scully yeah, Pop poster. True. Yeah, Scully Pop is, yeah, all, I mean, if you want to take a look, you know, there's J. Scott Campbell. That's a beautiful Jen Brumhill, Art Germ, etc. Yeah, we made those all for HQ. Um, Robert Fraga, you were here, so you would know. Uh, let's see, Dennis Parrish, uh, have you tried the cherry bombs I gave you? I haven't. <laughs> I, should I? I heard those. I, I yeah, tried it. It's pretty freaking amazing. I'll bring them home. Cherry bomb is amazing. <laughs> Tonight is like happy hour. So maybe we'll get happy with some cherry bombs and bring back some of those maraschino cherries for that too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want some of those. Let's see. What else do we got? Oh. Right, uh, let me get some uh, like subtle uh, things in here. I just want to let people know that we are shipping this late at the action figure. And if for whatever reason you ordered one and you, you, you know, I don't know, you haven't got your shipping notice, please be sure to be in touch with inquiries at coffincomics.com. So we'll get you all set. Uh, just a little, little note there. And we're in the process. And we're in the yeah. process. Oh, yeah, we're yeah, deep, yeah, hey, we're going deep going getting we're shipped deep out. Process. Yeah, these, it's a lot of fun. There's just a tons of boxes going out. I mean, I think yeah, there's quite a few ordered. All right. Yeah. Any you guys have any more questions for Brian while we're still live with Beers with Brian? Beer with Brian. Oh, would you ever consider signing sessions at HQ for an artist celebrations? So what do you mean by that exactly? I'm not quite sure what that means. I do. Uh, yeah, well, okay. we had uh, Harrigan here doing the signing. Yeah, we did quick. have Harrigan here. And when we do an artist signing with local folks, you know, talent like Mike DiBalfo, he'll come in to sign. Um, well, it would be great to have a guy like Jesse Witchman, but he lives all the way in upstate New York, and he is a doting dad, so he cannot, <laughs> he's got his business out there, so it's just, we're just grateful that he was able to participate. Again, friendly reminder, this Tuesday, you're hearing it here first, we actually haven't told anybody else, but Lady Death Cataclysmic Majesty Digital, which actually wound up being 56 pages of story and art, is going out to you guys who are backers of that campaign. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Someone did mention you should do a catastrophic variant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. True. Yes, that is true. Someone did mention that. You know, sometimes we do stuff like that. Like, I remember our first big mistake, which was called, it was Lady Death Chaos Rules. This was for the comic market. We had an edition called Inferno by Jesse Witchman. And it got okay. past myself, it got past Nick, it got past the printer, and we mistakenly misspelled it as Infermo. <laughs> Don't forget Infermo. Blasphemy. Bla above Blasphemy. Blamsphemy. Blamsphemy. <laughs> On the Huffa Foil, it was great. Sometimes it happens. Uh, someone said, a Lady Death Elvira cover? Well, I think Lady Death is published by Di Dynamic Entertainment. And we, we don't have a working relationship with that company, so I don't see that occurring. Are you saying an homage mm. or actual team up of the two? Well, I know we've done a homage of it. Um, yeah, we have done a The homage Dark of Mistress it. was Dark the Mistress. name of that edition. Yeah. I mean, team ups are a whole other like ball of wax. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's this? Uh, oh, the guy's like, I have the Infermo mm -hmm. issue. Infermo! Infermo! Monty's on there. <laughs> Hi, Monty. Hi, Monty. How are you? Hey, Monty Moore. How are you doing? All right. I just shared with Monty before I came here an upcoming edition. So in June, we are going to be celebrating the birthday of the U.S. Army. And Monty Moore, not only has he provided art for what we're calling the Vintage Army Edition, he provided a beautiful, heartfelt poem. Both Monty and myself are very supportive of the U.S. Armed Forces. Love them. Uh, they are the closest thing to angels we have on this planet, in, to me. And uh, yeah, Monty did a real bang-up job, so you'll see it. And the, the poem that Monty Moore wrote is actually included on the back cover. It's really, really cool. Oh, that's rad. Yeah, it's really rad. Eric Hart, Lady Death Rock and Roll Album Homages oh. Covers. Coming! <laughs> oh! You heard that here. You heard that here first, starting in the fall. That's right. Nice. We're actually considering like uh, 
September is the launch of like a kind of rock and roll theme, which more to come. You will see. Oh, there you go. You got your answers. Oh, Don McTague is watching. Hey, Don, how are you? Don. How's it going? Boy, Don, we're really happy that you did that. I mean, when I saw that La Muerta that came in, oh it was gosh. unbelievable. Stunning. Oh, it was crazy. Again, I, so I can't thank you enough. And the other thing that I... This is fun because we could we could tell you guys this. <laughs> I know that in May, Dawn begins work on her Hell Witch versus Lady Death cover. Ooh. So who knows? And I'd actually be giving her a little bit more uh, input. But I think it could be worth. Gosh, this is fun. it's just fun to like do all these reveals. Tell everybody. What's really fun is the story Hell Witch versus Lady Death. The great majority of the story takes place in Las Vegas. Yeah, and that was uh, one of uh, Mike McLean's ideas, where to set this story. So it's set in contemporary Las Vegas. So it's such a great opportunity in terms of the covers to include all that beautiful iconography. I mean, this is a battle, and it goes all across. It goes, the, goes on the Strip. It goes on, you know, across various uh, casinos, inside casinos, penthouse suites, Inside an arena, inside like the Neon Museum, it, it happens all across that. And Dawn is one of the many wonderful contributors on that piece. So I just can't, no pressure. I just, she's going to come up with something rad. She usually does. <laughs> Any Ryan Kincaid covers coming up? Well, I am going to call Ryan Kincaid and see if he's available for a couple covers next week. So <laughs> oh, well, there you go. It's totally on my plan. <laughs> hey, folks, the other thing I would like to say while we're here, and, and for your consideration, is we are actually launching another Kickstarter through our sister company, Coffin Collectibles. And that will be the Lady Death Majestic Series Statues. Now, that Kickstarter will launch June 2nd and run through July 2nd. What we'll be doing is offering the Majestic Classic Edition, the Scarlet Edition, and the Heaven Sent Edition. They could be purchased individually, or we will actually offer all three as a set. It'll be limited to 100, and they will be all serial number matched. So more information coming as the weeks move on. To get the latest information about that, please join us at coffincomics.com. In the upper right-hand corner, just sign up to our mailing list, and you're going to get the latest on that. So that Kickstarter is coming. It's barreling toward us. So please expect a lot more photos, video, turnaround video on all the statues so you can really make an informed decision about what it is you're interested in. I will say that the classic edition will be, quote-unquote, an open-run edition and that the Scarlet Edition will be limited to 300 copies, and the Heaven Sent Edition will be limited to 200 copies. Both the Scarlet Edition and the Heaven Sent Edition will be exclusive to the Kickstarter campaign. It will be the only way one can secure those. So thank you for listening on that piece. I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, I guess, you know, it's part of the Beer with Brian thing, too, is just kind of like what I'm ruminating on and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, I can't believe it's almost May. Can you guys believe that? <laughs> no. I mean, it's crazy. But I'm really happy as a company. We uh, made a couple changes in our efficiencies, and I I'm just proud of everyone uh, at Coffin Comics and just how how uh, well run behind the scenes that we are. You guys are – I'm grateful that you guys experience us as like you know, rock solid, but we're always internally trying to make improvements. And what I can say from an editorial perspective is that we as a company, are, we're always ahead, we're always on time, but we are so much further ahead in starting projects so much sooner than we have in the past. And it, that's awesome. So as opposed to like uh, all our projects being just in time, now we're actually starting to, like every three months, every quarter, we're trying to pull it back a couple of weeks so that we're well, well, well in advance. At, sort of as evidenced by Lady Death Chapter 15. Like, we just completed the first 24 pages, about two more weeks, and we're going to be done with that. And that would be a book that we're going to offer in March of 2022. So that's kind of, I mean, honestly, that's the whole thing. Um, this is a working man's company. I don't think there's anyone that's kind of like, you know, like uh, dialing it in here at Coffin Comics. We're hard at work every day, you know. Uh, yeah, and uh, myself included, you know, uh, Every day, it's wake up, what's up, and taking care of everything from 
charting the course of the company to communicating to the colorist, no, that eye color is wrong. So like, and everything in between, you know, which is exactly how I personally like it. Just very immersive experience. Anybody else have any questions? Scott No just announced Mr. Harrigan did a Iron Maiden La Muerta cover for me recently. Oh, how nice. Look forward to seeing that. Yeah. I also wonder, Scott, what you're going to be uh, playing this weekend on the turntable. I know that... Uh... Oh, let me tell you the easy -O story. Dude, check this out. True story. So, late 80s. I love uh, MTV Headbangers Ball. And as much as I like all the popular stuff we like, I love liking deep track, hard to find, obscure music. And I joke around here in the office and I say if more than 10,000 people like it, it's got to suck. So um, I am watching MTV and as you know, MTV Headbangers Ball is playing all the hits, but occasionally they'll play a band like Easy O. So they play Easy O and I fall in love instantaneously. I learned that Gene Simmons produced the record. I like loudness and... Actually, this is a two-part story. So then, so then, Easy O was playing a place called The Ritz in New York City. So that was a great mid-sized music venue. I have so many other stories about The Ritz, but this story, and they're opening up for some band, some new band from LA I didn't ever hear about. But, so, we go to see Easy O, and they're great. And again, they're an opening act, maybe there's another act. But we decided to stick around for the headliner, because why not? The place was packed. And the headliner was Guns N' Roses. And it was Guns N' Roses before they popped off. So Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, people may not remember, but that record came out, and it took about a year for it to hook people. So anyway, that's part one. Part two. At the time, I lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, and mainly I'm working uh, on film sets. And if I'm working, I'm working very early. But if I'm not working, I'm getting up at like 10 o'clock in the morning. Maybe Francisca honestly is like waking me up. And then, then I'll just kind of go up the block and go to McDonald's and get a, get breakfast. So I do that one day. I do that one day in Hoboken, New Jersey, about 1988. I come up, go to go into McDonald's, and who is walking up the street? Easy O. Easy O. And so it's Easy O, and they're not dressed in uh, costumes that they would have on stage, but they're still super rad. They're all in black, they got the hair. I'm like, oh my, I, and I fanboy out. And this is sort of before fanboying was even a thing. I go, oh my God, Easy O, what the hell's going on? And what had happened was Easy O actually uh, came from Japan to Hoboken, New Jersey. That's where they lived and that's where they had a rehearsal space and they're trying to make a, make a shot at it. So they were supporting the record. So I stayed in touch with Easy O. I went to the pizza parlor with Easy O. I visited the rehearsal space while they were around. They finally, and then, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Then on their second record, which we came out, uh, a director that had worked with Paul Rackman actually made a music video for Easy O. So crazy story, all true. I was so thrilled. They totally didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Japanese, but I was just happy. Easy O, Easy O, <laughs> Easy O. So that is my Easy O story, and I, I love them. So uh, are there any final questions? Final questions. The man's enjoying his beer. You need to enjoy yours too at home. That's right. Uh, any confirmed guests for Sworn Fest? You know, I think we've got to get going on that, so expect it soon. Yeah, I mean, behind the scenes there's stuff going on. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. There was really, you know, there was a certain... Everybody was confirmed the original version. COVID happened, and now with all travel restrictions, you know, stand by, because the, the, the announcements are coming up. But... You know, as cool as uh, Fiend Fest was, we, we just have some plans for Sworn Fest. I th you just got to be ready. I can't wait. And I know that people get it. It's just like get ready not to sleep and, you know, just get ready. <laughs> Lots of coffee and booze. Yeah, we, the fun thing, too, if you've been there the first time, it's like we actually have booze available, you know, whenever you're legally able to have it on the floor. We provide coffee for free, water for free. I mean, I think that these are the sorts of things that you should have at an event. Mm -hmm. So people get coffeeed up or get people get liquored up. Like, whatever. <laughs> it's going to be so fun. Yeah. People are requesting Mark Brooks. Mark Brooks. As a guest. As a guest. Fest. Okay. Right on. <laughs> I mean, I would say I love Mark Brooks. He's the man. I And uh, we actually, you know, back when Mark did that cover for Lady Death, we were actually discussing, like, having him come out for the launch, which would have been... Whatever, whichever one he's gonna come out. He's about <laughs> who knows. I don't remember. He was all, all about it. So yeah, I can't wait to do that in person stuff. All right. How many people are expected at Sworn Fest? Do we know? 
I mean, as we sit, we really don't know. Last time was about 360 people all in. So uh, I don't, I haven't even checked tickets. But what I can tell you is when we announced the, excuse me, the postponement, we offered people the opportunity to have their money back in case it was no longer convenient to them. And I will tell you that our ticket retention was 99%. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, and as soon as we re-announced, then those 1% just repurchased their tickets. <laughs> so yeah, I would say, I mean, look, I'm feeling pretty good that by the time we get around to February 26th when we're having Sworn Fest that most of any restrictions are off. And we also have really increased the space dramatically. So, I mean, I would be happy to have 666 people attend Sworn Fest from around the world. You heard it. I want to see that number. <laughs> Make it happen, folks. Yeah. Worldwide, I think we can. Let's do it. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Let's see, what else do I want to mention? Again, just uh, catas Cataclysmic Majesty <laughs> Digital coming out. Um, you know, the hooligan showed these, but I'm going to show them again. So coming up on the... When we're to, oh. On the look. You feel, it's so pretty. <laughs> it causes you pain. It causes stuff. me pain. It's so amazing. The art is just sick. So this is the art of La Muerta. Uh, the main cover by Sun K and the special limited edition by Paolo. These are the backs. And what I did is I personally selected some really neat pieces. The uh, end leaves, these are called, features oh. art that had been done a long time ago by Joel Gomez. I am happy we could finally That's utilize it. That's cool. Yeah, isn't that neat? You know, up to now, we had done, like, white paper and yeah. people could sketch on it. But I just couldn't resist these skulls. <laughs> no. Dude, that's fucking sick. And it makes these, that book pop. You know, it's yes. nice virgin art. Uh, great stuff. Uh, John Boy. Uh, this is uh, Matt Meerhoff. Jen Brumhill. Classic image by Scott Lewis. That's that, one that, of my favorite images. The Reaper. You know, yeah, the Reaper by Monty Moore. Beautiful Sun K, that cool uh -huh. clowning image. And... You know, the list goes on, truly. It's uh, it's very difficult to pick yeah. just a certain amount of images. But, you know, a who's who of all the outlaw independent style artists that we all love and adore. Ebass, Brandon Peterson. I mean, Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo. Yep. Yeah, all your favorites and mine. Uh, just, yeah, the list goes on and on and on and on. Are the images say, the same in each book? They are. So the interiors remain the same. And what happens is with a special limited edition, it's going to come with an exclusive print, two holofoil cards. And then this comes with the printed on coffin-shaped book plate, which uh, I will sign and then we'll serial number. And so, yeah, these will be available on the Kickstarter, and we ask for your support on those. Man, mm. they're, they're so much fun those to do. Those are beautiful. They're fun to do. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just, mm. So it's such a fun character to work on because it's, Tapping into such a cool history, visual history to deal with. Ooh. Yeah, I, I can't wait till you guys see uh, Onslaught. I mean, we really live with these projects. You know, the, the story was plotted last year, and then Joel Gomez, you know, really takes his time. We get the pages in. It's funny because I work kind of early in the morning to like normal hours, and then Joel's always sending in his work at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And it's so hard to resist not looking at it and really luxuriating in it. But yeah, we, I mean, with comics, it's just a, it's just, overall, it's just a labor of love. So I hope you love what we did with Onslaught. What makes Onslaught interesting and different, I believe, from other La Muerta stories is, up until now, we're really dealing with this street-level crime in this kind of interesting heightened reality. Um, the, the Gomez designs on the characters and the villains are just, they're, they're, they're new. You know, they're remarkable. And now, since this is a death apocalypse tie-in, we took this, I don't know who came up with it, probably Mike McLean, but do you guys remember that movie, Assault on Precinct 13? Mm -hmm. The premise was, in the original John Carpenter version, it was a couple of police officers who were tidying up and closing down a police precinct, and then they were gonna leave, but they are attacked by a gang. So kind of roughly working with that premise, what we said was that uh, uh, La Muerta is visiting her ally Loco and his whole team in a place called Fiesta World. So Loco is our barrio Batman and Fiesta World is his Batcave. Now there's a local gang who've had it and are seeking revenge and come after our team. They have a horrible firefight but in the middle of that, in the middle of that, Insurrectus's progeny rises up on the outskirts of 
phoenix, this 300 foot tall monster, and on top of it is yet another monster, and they are tasked by Insurrectus to kill the guardians, destroy the guardians of humanity. So they're attracted to some supernatural element of a character. And what happens is a thousand monsters come and attack Fiesta World. And it's up to La Muerta and her pals to team up and face off against these things. But it begs the bigger question. The way we've presented La Muerta, she's a human being. She doesn't have any supernatural ability. So why would the progeny be after her? You will have to read the story to understand. And this story features a guest appearance by the one and only Lady Death. So oh, it's beginning. Yes. Yes. Death Yes. That's right. Well, this is a serious, straight-up Death Apocalypse tie-in. Anyway, so yeah, uh, please uh, consider backing that one. Mm -hmm. If you haven't considered La Muerte, this is a good jumping-on story. I'm proud to, I'm proud to publish La Muerte. I mean, honestly, uh, I am the editor, but really, it's Mike McLean writing, and man, he is in his element writing crime, and Joel, who's just flourishing. I mean, it really. You know, they've really taken it over, and you know, my role is to guide them and to, uh, in a sense, just lay the platform for them to have some fun, and man, those guys deliver the good. C.C. De La Cruz, of course, delivering on the, the coloring, and veteran letter, Marshall Dillon, like, rocking it out. So I think this is, a, it truly is an action-packed one. I mean, we call it the Night of 10,000 Bullets, so that should give you an idea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Nicole Rogers, will there be any La Muerta boxes available anytime soon? Yes. There you go. That's your answer. There you go. You're damn right there will be. <laughs> I love those collector's boxes. Everybody's liking those collector's boxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, the inside scoop is we can, from our supplier, we cannot get enough of those boxes. True. You know, we just keep offering them in like 500, 1,000 at a time. Crazy. True. Bob Wren. Bob. <laughs> Brian, people are dying to know who is your favorite boy band. New Kids on the Block! <laughs> God! New Kids on the Block! He said it. Didn't you see it with his eyes? My favorite <laughs> boy band is Slayer. Ah, there you go. Now that's a boy band right there. That's right. World Painted Blood. No sanctuary. World Painted Blood. No. That's the only boy band I know. That's not true. That's true. <laughs> Do you guys see what I have to put up with? Do you see what the cross that I have to bear? Justice for Sparkles? Yes! No, Nicole. Yes! No justice for Sparkles. Yes! Only Jeff. No. <laughs> Ow. That's abuse. That goes against our company policy. You have to understand that Brandy Sparkles is heavily, heavily outvoted here inside this culture. You know, we all, us guys, like, uh, uh, we all fancy ourselves as uh, music snobs and music <laughs> nerds. And, you know, all our, all of our leanings are towards, like, metal, hard rock, goth, industrial, you know, obscure, you know. And then Brandy comes in with this, <laughs> what the heck, what? <laughs> what can I say? It, it yeah, it's, it's terrifying. You're welcome. welcome. Whereas Julie and I, you know, we're, we're off in the corner and we're talking about cool, obscure goth bands. Like, hey, man. like the Backstreet Boys. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, hey man, you, you remember that band Theater of Hate? You know, just like obscure, cool stuff that only, again, if more than a thousand people know about it, you know, it's not good. <laughs> oh, here's a good rock and roll question. Brian, have you seen your dream concert yet? Man, can I recount a dream concert? <laughs> First of all, I feel blessed as a comic book creator who loves heavy metal and rock and roll. It has allowed me to meet all my heroes, everyone. I've met, I've met so many. But if you have a couple minutes, I'm going to tell you a story. So <laughs> um, in 2004, myself, what's that, Brandy? Scott No said, update for 2021, Brandy. It's the wrong stuff. That's True. right. There you go. So. In 2004, a very dear friend of mine, James Collins, owner of JC's Comic Stuff in Toledo, Ohio, followed OzFest. We saw a bunch of dates in the Midwest. We were just slumming it at night, sleeping wherever we could, and we are just having a good time. And on the second stage, would begin at 8.30 in the morning with the band Lacuna Coil. And there oh, were so nice. many bands that were new to me. So including, I just 
on that tour, I experienced the following bands for the first time. Um, Hatebreed, Slipknot, I knew of them, but to see them. And then Lamb of God. And when I saw Lamb of God, it started starting all this intense visuals for me, and I like, I, I just fell in love with that band. So I had the opportunity to see them three times on that tour, and they just blew me away. I just thought they were, you know, they're just the next level. And uh, Metal Legend, my boy, actually reached out to Lamb of God. I don't know how he did, and he, he connected myself in the band in 2005. They played out here at a place called Mesa Amphitheater, and they played um, Sounds of the Underground. So, I'll give you the bottom line of, of that experience, which was incredible. Um, I meet up and meet Randy Bly in particular in person, and instantaneously we just get along. He's a very, he's a very smart person. We have a lot of similarities and what we enjoy. We're having a blast. Now, Randy was not on the wagon at that time. He has since been on the wagon. I have so many Lamb of God stories. But anyway, um, we partied with Guar, which was all great. But here's the thing. Right before we're going on, or they're going on stage, I say, wait, they're going on stage. The, the place is about to erupt. It's bananas. Clutch has just played. It's insane. And Randy's just an amazing host. So we go up through the back. They're all hidden. And he points me to just the side stage, just out of sight. And then the band starts playing and he goes, just a minute. And then he disappears. And then he, and then the music is building and it seems like he's going to be late because, you know, it's about to come in and he flies right past me. He smashes a beer down on the speaker and just blasts out and starts the song. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? And so I just, you know, raised the beer up and, uh, I, I've actually been blessed in that friendship and relationship with Lamb of God. I've had all my favorite songs dedicated to me. Uh, Walk With Me in Hell, which, uh, look, if you're a metalhead, you get this. I mean, Walk With Me in Hell is a very deep spiritual song for me. And I feel the same way about many, many Slayer songs. People don't see it that way. I do. And um, The Faded Line is another song. I mean, just even thinking about it makes me emotional. The lyrical content is so intense. So that's just a quick Lamb of God story. And I, I mean, I, I got Lamb of God stories that'll go on forever. And I think they are one of the more remarkable acts that we have seen in the last 20 years. So that's a quick rock and roll story. And again, I feel blessed. I have so many. It's, I got all kinds of rock and roll stories, man. <laughs> I can't wait till we get back to concerts. Would you ever consider making an homage art book of classic work of Stephen Hughes? Um, I mean, that's a very good and very direct question. Stephen Hughes was a singular, incredible talent, one of the most important creative relationships I've had in my life. What I think out of respect for Hughes is to let his legacy live and stand as it is. I, I would actually, I would, I would not do that. All right, any other questions before uh, we start drinking some more? <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you guys hanging out. Yeah, I like all the rock and roll stories, man. Yeah, quite a few. Striper, striper, striper. Say what you will about striper, man. You know, you know the lead singer's got the pipes. I, I, I'm down with striper, man. I don't, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a religious person, but I mean, striper, you know, they're a good band. <laughs> Who was your first concert? My first concert was in, I think it was 1971, and it was David Cassidy solo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You heard it here first. Now that's something we should all do shots to. <laughs> I think I love you. That's one of my favorite songs. I think I love you. So what am I so, so afraid, afraid of? I think that, that I'm not sure of. of. A love there, there is there's no, no cure, cure for. for. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really funny? Speaking of that, music's always played some sort of element of my life, and I distinctly remember things. I remember the summer of my sister being 16, and that was the same summer that. The Doors Light My Fire just took oh, over the exactly. world. And there was like a big house party that was crushed by the Hells Angels. And I remember that. And then a couple years later, I just fell in love with the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. And my the first the album I ever bought with my own money was a Sly and the Family Stone record. And it's kind of funny to think that the first record I had was Sly and the Family Stone. And then maybe a couple years later, now I'm into that bubblegum pop stuff. You know, monkeys, partridges, that kind of stuff. Mainly partridge family. 
I thought they were great. I thought Osmonds were a bunch of pumps. I thought Bobby Sherman was a pump. But, <laughs> but I, I like the Partridge family. Poor Marie. And, and the monkeys. What's that? The monkeys are Monkeys are great. Yeah, and the monkeys. So anyway, that was my first one. I think one of the... But I kind of redeemed myself because then my next concerts are insane. I saw... Uh, Van Halen opened for, uh, or Iron Maiden opened for Van Halen the first time they ever came over. That'd be 85. So even before oh, that, wow. I saw Rolling Stones in 78. I was seeing Cheap Trick and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Tell Carmen to re ask the question. What was your question, Carmen? Resend it. The one you want to be answered more than any other. Shoot it to me. Let's see if there's anything else. Ace's first concert was Aerosmith. That's great. Mine's was the Beach Boys. All right, there you go. Was it with Brian uh, Wilson? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. But You're welcome. Other, all the other versions are fake. And then there was... <laughs> and my second one was Huey Lewis, and that was the first concert I ever smoked, po smelled pot at. I didn't smoke it because I was like... I was very young. <laughs> Huey Lewis, I, I can't touch you. that. No, I actually, uh, when I worked at the Portland Zoo, I, I would rent <laughs> chairs for concerts. Huey Lewis is one of the shows I was renting uh, concert chairs to, and I was blown away by the performance because like, wow, that was a tight band. He's so good. Yeah, they were really He's good live. I was impressed. Performer. Yeah, we all kid around. Honestly, for me, I, I'm fine with, you know, back, back in the day, uh, long before comics, I used to work in commercial arena in New York City on commercials, music videos, pieces of movies that would come in. And I worked with a lot of hip hop, um, hair bands, whatever was like going on at the day. And you know, frankly, I, I respect anyone who really puts in the work, so I get it. I mean, Huey Lewis in the news, what I would say is that, you know, it's really hooky, it's fun, it makes people happy, so that's fine. I, I really, all this stuff is all just jest. I mean, you're not going to get me to fucking listen to it. Pardon my language. <laughs> but, That's yeah, not true. If he's walking through the warehouse and they're playing, he has no choice. So here's my controversial, <laughs> my controversial music thing. It's like um, every dude I know, every dude that's my dude, love Rush. Mm. I respect it, but I don't get it. I, don't like I totally it. respect it, but I don't get it. Anyway. Is there a question? Yes, Carmen, Carmen. Will we be seeing a Hellwitch art book in the near future? Well, Carmen, I think you, I, it's as if we like passed that question to you. In fact, yes. The answer is yes. So during during the Hell Witch vs. Lady Death Wargasm, Wargasm. Wargasm Kickstarter campaign, we will offer the following. Uh, Hell Witch Risque, which will be a hardcover art book. And we will also offer Hell Witch Slays, Volume 1, which will collect the first three stories. Yes. There so, you go. So the answer is yes. yes. Woo-hoo! <laughs> All right, anything else before we call it an afternoon and a weekend and get ready for some drinking? We're Carmen is very drinking. happy. I'm not. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm holding the camera. Oh, right well, now. Cameraman. Me. <laughs> <laughs> me, me, I'm shit. Oh, Okay. Scott knows to say Neil Peart was a great drummer. Uh, that is true. Again, I respect him. I mean, uh, I'm a John Bonham guy, but it's also like measuring all this stuff is ridiculous. You know, you could love it all. And sometimes your favorite color depends on mood, right? You know, it's like sometimes my favorite drummer is John Bonham. Sometimes it's Charlie Benante. Sometimes it's Chris Adler from Lamb of God. So it's like, eh, whatever. All right. So we have some Team Hell Witch people. A lot of now. Team Hell Witch has Team been Hell popping Witch up people. today. It, it, it's not a done deal. Folks, get ready to vote again on La Muerta, Onslaught. Get your vote in. You want to help which to win? You got to vote. Woo. You back that campaign, you get a vote. You get a totem, you get five votes. It is statistically possible. <laughs> well, I don't know, folks. I thank you so much for checking in, you know, just uh, kind of rambling on, trying to catch up. You know, I've been kind of like undercover doing my thing, but I want to thank you guys for checking in. This has been Beer with Brian. Have a tremendous weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that Mike, was Mike. Mike just showed up. <laughs>